Well, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the New England Racing Show, Manchester, New Hampshire, Channel 23, also on YouTube. And like us on Facebook, you'll get the show automatically. Well, uh, we have two guests on today. We have Mike Douglas Jr. Our, uh, quite a few times we've had him on as a guest and another one of his pit crew members, Cynthia Tibbetts. So we have two thirds of the Mike Douglas racing team. <laughs> Dad, the other, the other uh, one third <laughs> doesn't want to come on, and it's too bad because he's he used to be quite a super modified driver back at Star in the uh, 70s, early 80s, and uh, I'm sure he's got a lot of good stories to tell. But anyway, we have the other two thirds, so we're going to talk modifieds and super modifieds and Star Speedway. So, Mike, uh, how's it going with your car? You told me it's sort of in pieces, like yeah. a lot of cars. Yeah, it's in pieces. Uh, getting a lot of the stuff done up. You know, as far as like the uh, MRS passed a new rule where the rear of the uh, fuel cell mount has to be rounded, not squared off. So we're doing that. Also, on the left side, the uh, head protector bar needs to be just about, you know, right there on you. So... We had to cut that out and we're doing that. And, you know, we're slowly doing updates and things like that. Um, just like everybody else in New England, I don't think anyone's hurrying real real lot because uh, snow's still on the ground where I live. I don't know about where you guys are. but <laughs> Well, we all live right around yeah. Manchester. So I, I know that uh, New Hampshire Fisher Cats, uh, they had to get a plows out there and uh, dump trucks and try to clear the field out because they had a couple of feet of snow on on the field last week mm -hmm. and that's the only way that they're going to get it to melt because their opening day is like three weeks away uh, you got to get the snow off and then let the field drain and uh, i don't know about the tracks uh <laughs> icebreaker is april 12th at uh thompson lee's going to have an act race that day also and I don't know how that's going to work out but they have to start postponing stuff uh, there's going to be a log jam of races <laughs> rain tires will help out too now that sidebar you're talking about on the modified is that something that came about because of the Blewett accident uh, I don't think so I think it was just more or less of like a uh, you know safety deal um, we did have one on our Spafco car but it was a little further back so the, basically the rule was just to bring it up a little further so it's about right in the center of the driver's head yeah. um i don't know why they did it to be honest but they did it if it's for safety then no one should really complain about it <clears throat> what kind of chassis do you have a spafco race chassis okay. kenny barry builds them and where's he out of uh preston connecticut if you uh ever go to mohegan sun he's yeah. about uh eight miles or ten minutes whatever away from him and so well, if you go gamble and you get lucky, go buy yourselves a chassis. Well, when we go to Waterford, uh, I, I'm not sure what exit Mohegan Sun is. I've never th been there. I don't know why, but 86 sticks out. Okay. Cause Uncasville, something like that. Waterford is 77, I believe. Exit 77? Yes, it is, 77. Okay, so it's a little way. <clears throat> I'd love to go down there and take a tour of the place, and uh, I'll have to I'll have to get back to him. That's, Ken, that's Spafco. That's Ken Barry. Yep, Ken Barry. Then you have, uh, is it Fuller? Yeah, Fuller. Uh, I believe with one of the, I uh, can't remember, he used to be a cup crew chief. Uh, they have LFR based out of, LFR, North, Car based out of North Carolina. Um, I think they're building a new shop or they're going in cahoots with somebody up in uh, Connecticut area. Would it be Eddie Flemke and Reggie? It could, yes, you're right. It is them. Oh, really? They're, I, they're I, thi teaming up? I think so. And that's Raceworks, isn't it? Yes. Um, if anyone knows more than I do on it, <laughs> write in, type in. But I'm pretty sure they are, they are, uh, they teamed up with someone. Yeah. So they're going to have an LFR, uh, you know, kind of like New England or Northeast area. Um, hey, if it, more chassis builders, you're going to bring in more teams, you know. It's now, uh, I hear uh, a green area auto and they talk about uh, the new Troyer chassis. The rear is different. And Ryan Priest drove one down at, uh, is it New Smyrna? New Smyrna, yes. And he said it's unbelievable. He could do whatever he wanted in the corner and it reacted. So uh, I guess the car won like six out of seven nights. Yep. 
So I, do you know anything about the rear, what, why, why it's different? I have no clue. I've talked to a couple of guys about it, but I don't have the knowledge to say it on here without looking foolish. Okay. Um, to me, I mean, race car is a race car. If it's got four springs, four shocks, rear end, Well, we'll check one out when we, uh, when we see them, maybe at the icebreaker. Yeah, well, I'm, if it's the... Uh, I know they have a developmental car or, or something like that. Yeah. It's like the TA2 or something like that. I mean, I'm sure they'll have the uh, the rear ends all. Well, all, Ryan uh, got the first car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good for him, though. You know, rightfully so. He's such a good driver. He sure is. We used to race quarter midgets with him. And uh, I keep saying that. You see all these kids coming out of quarter midgets, and they're all doing awesome. So, uh Okay, so your other, one of your pit crew members is Cynthia here? Correct, my uh, spotter. A spotter? Yes. Okay, so you, you need a good spotter, right? Yeah, I, sure. He doesn't, he doesn't <laughs> yell at me too often. <clears throat> when did they start spotting modifieds? I was getting the wrong kid. A long time? I, I mean, I basically went from watching Dad in a Super to a hobby stock, and when we wanted to go mods... He said you need a spotter. Oh, okay. And that would, I mean, we didn't know. I mean, everything was new to us. Because the Supers never had spotters, right? Mm. And they still don't. They I still mean, don't. You, you, uh, someone was trying to sell us a pro stock a few couple of years ago. So my son Jake sat in it. It was Duncan Miller, and it yeah. was in his garage. And, and Jake sat in it, and he goes, Dad, I can't see anything. <laughs> So now I know why they have spotters. Yeah, it's like a little box you're, you're staring out of. Yeah, with the post and everything. Yeah. And, and maybe some of it is the uh, full containment that you oh. can't see. Or does that get in your way? Uh, no, not really. I mean, that's basically all the way they're cut. I mean, they have like the tubular uh, LaJoy style ones. Yeah. And they have the ones more like the where they come down. Um, I know the NASCAR one seems like it really sticks out a lot on the right side, but... I mean, I'm sure you, you know, you just kind of get comfortable and you get used to it and, you know, you work with your spotters and, you know, things like that. And, yeah. I mean, you kind of know when you pass somebody or someone, you know, you can hear, you know, regardless what people think, you can hear people when they're on the outside or, yeah. you know, the inside of you. So you just That's what PJ use, says. And you can see their shadow, too. Yeah. If, you can just kind of use your best judgment. Yeah. Because in the midgets, there's no, no spotters. Mm. But, but it also, seems... You see some spotters that tried to drive the car from the grandstands, and that's not the way to do it. Yeah, it doesn't it. work out too good. <laughs> when, I talk, when I talk to Mike, I only try to let him know what the safety officials are talking about or if there's a safety issue on the track. But when he's actually in traffic, I let him do his job and keep my mouth shut. Oh, really? I don't, what what I don't do you say to him if, if a yellow comes if out? If a yellow comes out, where it is, where to avoid, where to go, if there's fluid or if there's parts of debris everywhere. Yeah. You know, or if the safety officials or, you know, the track officials are warning him about something or somebody else, maybe somebody's been laying their bumper on him and I'll, you know, let him know that they're being watched already. Oh, okay. So he might have got a, a black flag pointed at him or something. Right, and try to keep him calm best yeah. I can. But, yeah, I've seen some spotters and I've, some of them I've sat next to that seem to want to drive the car from the grandstands. And if I, know. I were a driver, I'd be so annoyed with that. Annoyed, huh? <laughs> Didn't Dale Jr. yell at his spotter and swore at him? I, I was watching it last night on YouTube. He was yelling at his spotter. Uh, uh -huh. They had in-car in -car audio between the spotters and the drivers oh, from okay. a bunch of different cars for like three or four minutes last night, and, and I was, was watching that. And he was swearing at him? Uh, yeah, I think he did. Well, that sounds fun. That sounds familiar. That sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think Danica used to do that, too. Well, she's not really a driver. Blame the spotter for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember back uh, in early 80s when we were doing the Speedy Dry at Star, the Pro Stocks didn't have spotters. And uh, Paul Matthews, does you remember that name? Actually, mm -hmm. Paul Matthews stops in uh, by the garage, oh. usually about once every month, and you kind of just shoot the bull for a little bit. Yeah, he's a good guy. He, he, he That guy, he loves his modifieds, him. Oh, does he? Oh, yeah. He oh. loves the modifieds. He was a big pro stock guy. Yep. Along with, uh, I think your dad might have just started doing the uh, supers at the time. He left, they were called late models. Yeah. I always remember Paul in a uh, in a white. 51. White, white bodied car with a blue 51. That's, yeah. how, that's how I'll always remember and I remember Paul. he got, he got s somebody hit the guy behind him and drove him into Paul and spun Paul out and he's like who hit me so Ronnie and I were doing a speedy dry at style and we'd say well whoever hit you got run into and shoved into you so don't blame him and he'd go oh okay <laughs> but, 
And I can see how, you know, you see drivers get really pissed at the track and start throwing helmets, and I guess that's kind of outlawed now, but you can understand it. I mean, emotions get really high well, at the I, track. I don't know why guys throw their helmets. I mean, that's the, yeah, that's no. the uh, to me, throwing a helmet is absolutely ridiculous and immature. I mean, why would you want to throw the one thing that's, you know, saving your life? Now they <laughs> throw a steering wheel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're throwing everything. They're throwing the little booties off their shoes and all kinds of stuff. I had to laugh. Uh, Sean Monaghan, the uh, new promoter at Waterford. The new Waterford Speedway, yeah. Yeah, uh, Keith Rocco. Was they had a banquet a couple of weeks ago, and Keith Rocco got up there, and he says, "It's funny, the guy that's promoting the track is the guy that threw a steering wheel yeah, at me <laughs> last year." <laughs> that's good. That, says, let's, I forgive him. We'll get along. That's good that they got a uh, kind of resurrected that place, and actually that place picked up a fourth uh, tri track open modified series race. Right. Um, I don't believe it's a points race. I could be wrong, but from what I know right now, I don't think it is a points race. It's just mm-hmm. kind of like a like a real open, you know, like a, you know, old time style open show. Um, that'll be good. A couple along with Lee Seekonk and Manadnock. That's, I'm telling you right now, Tri Track Series is going to be a awfully good old school style race in the summer. Yeah. They've actually added a fifth modified race at Waterford also. And they have a, just added one at the end of October. That's definitely non points and squeeze uh, oh. open competition, but run under the tri track rules. Oh, oh really? But yeah, it's not the tri track race? It's not a tri track points race. The first race in September is a points race, but there's only three points races that'll count, so you can throw away your worst finish. Oh. So you don't have to run all four events if you don't okay. want to. But the event on October 26th, I believe, is going to be a true open event, big dollar open event, one day show only. Wow. And, and that should, I think. You have the icebreaker, and then you have the o- Oktoberfest, and then that'll probably be the last race of the season, if it's yeah. the last, you know. Very well, it could be. Pretty much uh, the same time as the Howler. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, they have a great schedule. They have uh, the Valente series is going to be there, mm-hmm. I believe, and uh, SKs every week. Uh they have NEMA there two or three times. They have our series of Wicked Cool Midgets once. Uh, it, I mean, a lot of tours. It, I thought that they wouldn't, you know, they'd sort of like run a limited schedule, but they're going full blast. Actually, Waterford's also added a Wheel and Modified Tour show also. Yeah, right. Wow. Plus, ISMA will be there, their annual stop in August. Yeah. Which is always, that Wings, Wings and Wheels show is always a great show. Right, and they go to uh, <clears throat> Leith on Friday and Waterford on Saturday. So uh, we'll maybe take both of those and we'll see. Uh, the big block supers. Speaking of supers, uh, Star is having the small blocks back. And they're going to run the Lee Crate Motors versus with a 650 four barrel. And they put out 380 horse, give or take a few versus built engines with a 550 two barrel and uh, steel heads I think you have to have you can't have aluminum heads and uh, unlimited money (laughs) so we'll see how that works out some people say that uh, that's not going to work out too good because the crate motors I know we only wound ours up to 6300 the built motors will be turning what about 7500 I don't know. Too Build much small about. block. What do you uh, turn? That's classified. No, um, <laughs> we're uh, we're we're starting to really you know put the cranks to it here. Um, you know, I've seen times you know eighty, you know eight grand. It really? Oh yeah. I mean, a, a lot of these you know because I mean we have you know we get the tire to pull it off you know so yeah. just you know wind it up and you know it helps you getting in you know as far as slowing down getting in the corner. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've heard some guys running next to them. It sounds like they're running an airplane motor in it. I mean, the thing yeah. just don't sound like it's, I mean, just stops. I mean, it just, they wind them up. Well, that's going to be interesting because, from what I understand, you can send your carburetor out, and it may say 550, but they'll do things to it, and it'll flow like 650. So, if they're running against a 650 four barrel crate engine, I mean, it, it doesn't sound too even. As long, as, as long as they keep tech on it and make sure they keep things equal. Well, they, they do what they call the go-no-go, no go, which you know mm-hmm. what that is, but they do other things underneath that to, to try to get the air flowing, even though it's a certain bore. Uh, 
I'm not sure what all the tricks are, but uh, I know that you can send them out from what I talked to uh, uh, a super modified uh, parts supplier of ours. I'll let him rena- re- remain anonymous, but he tells me it's it's pretty much something that everyone has to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I talked to Bob Sr. And, and Bob Jr., Weber, about letting the uh, 604 fast burn engine come in that the Pass Tour runs and the Granite State Pro Stock runs with aluminum heads and 470 horse with a 650 and see if maybe they can run on par with the built engines and they'll give the lead crate engines a weight break. Uh, and they said they're thinking about that. But they're going to start off and see how things shake out. I'm sure it's all going mean, to be you trial and error. Yeah, you can't figure all this out right away. I think they're going to give a 100-pound <clears throat> weight break to the crate engines. And we'll see if that's enough. Because we took our car there to test and tune, and we got it down to 12.5. And I remember back in 1978, Paul Richardson set a track record at Star at 12 flat with a big block. <laughs> I'm like, boy, we're not that far off. And I don't know what he was running for horsepower back then. What do you think? Back, mm, in, back in the 70s? Back in the 70s, I would probably say about 6, 650. Yeah. It was a big deal to get mm-hmm. one and a half horsepower per cubic inch then. Now, I mean, they're getting two and three horsepower. Well, of course, everybody was building their own motors in their own garages back then, too. They yeah. weren't sending them out for the high dollar I engines. I wasn't born yet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> your, dad, your dad used to build his own engines, I think. Sure did. And uh, he actually told me, he says, I don't do bad there at Star. I, I think it was $1,000 to win. Yeah. You don't need a lot of horsepower at Star. It's just it's all corner speed there. Yeah. If you can get off the, if you can get off the corner, the straightos will take care of themselves. Yeah. All handling and mm-hmm. he says I, I used to actually make money racing my super. As long mm-hmm. as you didn't crash it. And I don't I don't ever remember your dad crashing. I, I my from my father? <laughs> I saw quite a few <laughs> Not of in those. the wall. I mean <laughs> he might get tangled up with a lap car here and there, but uh, All the good ones, they uh, they wreck. You, like, he's told me more than a couple of times. You know, you got to wreck a few to win a few, and of course, I mean, dad's <laughs> dad's wrecked a few, but he's won quite a bit. Oh yeah, he, he won a lot. Uh, I remember uh, Jake, my son. We we told him it doesn't matter how many front bumpers you bend. I, I just don't want to see the rear bumper bend. <laughs> <laughs> and he bent a lot of front bumpers. We. We used to have Bobby Seymour make three or four of us at a time for us because if uh, somebody gave Jake a hard time on the yellow, he'd just hammer on him, <laughs> give him a little signal. Yeah, you got to do that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I remember uh, it, it was four to go, and they had a yellow, and you're supposed to line up single file, and one guy kept getting next to Jake. He thought it was double file, so Jake just shouldered him up the track, and then the guy got in line. <laughs> Because, you know, he, he gave him the signal like this, and the guy uh, gave Jake a signal that he was number one. Ah, so Jake just <laughs> hammered on him, <laughs> elbowed him up a little bit. What you got to do? Yeah, well, you know, you do what you got to do. But speaking of supers, like in California, we were talking on the way up here, uh, they run small blocks. They don't run big blocks. And they run two classes together, the uh, 410 small blocks with injection and methanol which must be big dollar engines if, if it's a world of outlaw engine and uh, then pretty much a crate engine and they'd run them together and they keep the classes separate the you know first and second in your class but that's like running isma and lee small blocks together and i can't see that working out on a quarter mile or three eighths mile you come up on lap traffic fast enough as it is i could imagine that's with that big of a difference there's going to be issues oh my son said i wouldn't even want to be out there in a small block i'd get in people's way and Mm -hmm. i'd be afraid that i'd wreck somebody unintentionally but um I, i talked to russ conway last year and he said the future is small blocks not necessarily a crate engine but he sees the big blocks going away I mean, when you're spending 65 grand for an engine, that's a little too much, I think. That's kind of what's killing the sport, too, is people can't afford it to get into it now. Yeah. Well, Mike Nettishin, for example, they're trying to get into it. Uh, he did pretty well at the Star Classic. I think he finished sixth 
because he drove a steady race. But he says, every time we turn around, it's 3,000 here, 5,000 there. And I'm thinking, if I got that kind of money, I got a lot of work to do in my house. I'm not going to buy a hand grenade engine, and you don't know how long it's going to last. But I remember when I got started in the sport, I was on Dave Stamp's super modified pit crew. That's how I got involved in the sport. Oh. And Dave blew a motor the week before the Star Cla- uh, before the Oswego Classic, threw a motor together, went out to Oswego, broke that motor, took the best of the two motors, put them together, and ran second to Doug Hevron at the Star Classic, finished second to Doug Hevron oh. with the leftover parts from this two junk motors. Yeah. And after the race, Doug wanted to sell us his used motor for 20 grand, and it's like, we just finished second to you with junk. We're not paying that kind of money. <laughs> what do you have in his engine, about $3,000? Probably, built in his garage, every bit of it. I, mean, I was there for two weeks in a row cleaning parts, getting that motor really? ready to get ready for the Star Classic. I remember when he had an upright uh, back in the 70s, and yeah, then he the bought Edmonds. one of the low-slung cars. No, he, he built and designed that car himself. Oh, he did? That roadster, The Roadster was built and designed in his garage. That's all Dave's handiwork. And is the car still around anywhere? Yeah, Timmy T still owns it. And the, that's the car that Dave Samard won all those races with in, is the, that right? in the 80s and early 90s. Then they built an exact copy of it. Yeah. And they have, Timmy T still has both cars sitting in, the, in I believe, a tractor trailer. I, I heard up. they're just sitting there and they're rusting out. Exactly. And he wanted a lot of money for them, and that's it. Yeah, what I heard, he has a couple miles crate motors sitting in crates just ready to go. It's like anybody would kill to get their hands on those motors. And why is he doing that? He's bought and paid for him. He doesn't owe anybody anything. They don't owe him anything. <laughs> well, I remember the uh, when Dave Samard was driving, <clears throat> Ronnie Poitras and I were doing the speedy dry at Star. So we're sitting in the inf- standing in the infield down in the first turn, and we're clocking Dave Samard, and he's turning a 10.8. Everyone else is turning 11.2. And I, I said, did you get what I got? I showed him. He says, yeah, I got the same thing. We just couldn't believe how fast that car was. It took Dave a few weeks, to, you know, basically a whole season to get the bugs worked out. But once he got it going, the car was fast. Yeah. In fact, Bentley Warren even told him when Dave moved away that you could come back here and build those cars and make a fortune. <laughs> yeah. This was before, you know, uh, New England Motorsports Supply was building cars and such, and, you know, Mazer's cars. Yeah. Yeah. That was before the Snafu 7 came out? Uh, it was, they came out about the same time. Yeah. But, but but Bentley told Dave, you come back here and build those frames, you'll make a fortune. Yeah. But instead, uh, the Snafu 7, became a lot of those became. Car. Now, that was a small block. Do you know anything about that engine? They st- I don't. I don't know anything about motors. I know it started as a small block, but I believe they eventually put a big block in it. Right. Because even Howie Lane was running a small block for a few years. But I remember that when Paul Richardson drove it, he would drive on the outside of everybody. And uh, people told me that was a big dollar engine to be able to do that. Well, if you remember, people like Jim Lowry used to set up his car to run the outside. Mm-hmm. Well, the other supers are freight trained on the inside of the turns. Jim yeah. would drive right around him on the outside because he was the only one smart enough to set it up to run out there. Really? Mike's I mean, father, too. Mike Douglas Sr. loved running the outside. That's no man's land unless you know how to do it. I remember the pro stocks, Babe Branscombe used to do that, run on the outside. But if you bobble a little bit, you fall back. <laughs> So you had to be really flawless to be able to do that. I remember, I think it was 1989, they had a modified race, and Jimmy Spencer won, and he passed everybody on the outside. Do you remember that? I really didn't get interested in modified. you remember that, Cynthia? Was that at Star? Yeah, it's I'm Star. I'm sure I was there. I don't remember that one in particular. I definitely remember Richie winning there, and oh, I remember okay. Jeff Fuller winning there, but I don't think I recall the Spencer one. Uh, it was like 88 or 89. He passed everybody on the outside, and he's in victory lane, and some the town drunk was yelling at him. <laughs> and he said, what do you want me to do? I passed everybody. I didn't hit anybody. Uh, I guess he didn't like him. In Epping? <laughs> I don't believe there's any town drunks in Epping. But I do remember Jeff Fuller winning. I think that was in 85 when they started the tour. That was the uh, Jack Neusner 2X. The what? The Jack Neusner 2X. Oh, okay. The, that Jeff won in at Star. That was 85. Yeah. Uh, they were just starting a tour, and Bob Weber had a an open race. And not that many cars showed up. I think like 12 or 15 tops. <coughs> uh, I remember they had one in like 85 that had about 24 or 25. 
you know, Richie Evans came and George Savory came and a few of the Beach Ridge cars came down. Yeah, I remember in 78 we were there in the pits and there was Jeff Bodine, Richie Evans, and uh, Ronnie Bouchard all pitted together with big blocks in their modifieds. And we're standing there listening to them uh, and the whole ground was shaking. Mm -hmm. I can imagine if they still had big block modifieds. I want them. <laughs> <laughs> You could do pretty well with one of those, right? An Isma engine? Yeah, I think it'd be a little nose heavy. Well, tell us about your, uh, we only got a couple of minutes left. Tell us about your YouTube with the supers from the 80s. Well, back in the day when I was on the crew, I used to, every time I could sneak off, I would take pictures of all the different race cars at the track, especially the supers. Yeah. And of course, this is back in the film days, so it cost for film and developing. And, yeah. You know, I, I wish we, I had camera in the digital age, but a few years ago, I scanned all my photos and put them into a digital format. Yeah. And over the years, I posted some here and there, maybe to Facebook or MySpace or a few of those places. And over time, I started doing more and more work with them. And all of a sudden, I, I started using the video format. I said, that'll be a great way to put them on Facebook or YouTube. So at least if anything happens to me, those pictures will still go on forever and, and people will be able to share them and enjoy them. Yeah. And the, the more I work on those videos, the better they're getting because I'm finding I get much more experience, so each one you can see gets a little more professional done. And I'm doing, you know, trying to keep playing like local bands in it too, so not only do I get right. a push for my photos, but I also give a push for local bands like a simple complex out of Manchester mm -hmm. or the connection out of Portsmouth, so that way, you know, it keeps them entertaining too. And yeah, right, right. As I'm getting better with my editing technique, I'm gonna be able to uh, time it, uh, the photo presentation better with the music. And anyone that wants to subscribe to your channel, what's it called? Uh, Cynthia Torque is on you know, YouTube.com. Okay, cool. Well, that about wraps it up for this week. Uh, half hour goes by real fast when you have two guests that can really talk racing, so maybe we'll have them on again soon before the racing season starts or if we have a break. Okay, thanks, Cynthia and Mike, for joining us, and we'll see you all Thank next you. week.